Genesis Foundation. Dub Lab. Welcome to The Quarantine Tapes, a daily podcast from Onassis, L.A. and Dublin. Hosted by Paul Holdengraber, this series chronicles shifting paradigms in the era of social distancing. Hello, could I please speak with Kwame Dawes? This is Kwame Dawes here. Hello, Paul. Kwame, it is such a pleasure and a privilege for me to speak with you, and I'm so happy that we're capturing your voice for the quarantine tapes. Thank you so much. Tell me, where do I find you now, and what might you be up to at this moment? How are you living, in other words, your quarantine time at the present time? I'm, I, yeah, I'm in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, where, 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 as you know, Paul, I teach at the University of Nebraska. And we, we shut down the university about a month and a half ago, maybe almost two months ago, um, in mid-semester. So I've been teaching from home, um, remotely, as they say, and um, just, you know, working it through. But yeah, in the sunny, sunny, sunny prairie land, that's where you find me right now. <sighs> You know, I haven't yet asked that from anyone, though I really do intend to speak to people who are teaching, both people who are teaching at universities such as yourself and people also who are teaching in in secondary school, as we used to call it, but also people who are teaching in kindergarten. I, I heard that it's really hard to teach online in kindergarten. The, the, the children sort of move away very quickly, not quite understanding what, what is asked from them. How is teaching remotely for you and what are you teaching remotely? Well, I'm teaching a course in Caribbean literature um, to to undergraduate students in this instance. Um, it's a curious thing, I have to say. I've, I've taught, this, of course, this, this happened in mid-semester. And I've taught remotely in the past, but this was something that we started off in. But here, in this semester, we had live lectures and so on. So what it was quite normal presence and so on. And we have this break and then everything is done remotely. And what I've found is there's been a peculiar quality of attentiveness, a kind of, um, at least I have more access to the way these students are thinking and they're engaging with the literature than I certainly did during the time when I was dealing with them face to face. It's just quite, quite remarkable. In fact, I'm finding it especially gratifying to see their engagement and their attentiveness. Um, and I think, I suspect, I mean, I haven't, I've avoided the Zoom, the Zoom uh, thing altogether. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've, we've suffered Zoom enough, I would say, I have so many meetings. But the classes, I've just given, I've recorded lectures and then engaged them in, in conversations by email or by, by these chat systems. Um, but I've asked them to write almost journal-like commentaries on the, the lectures and the, the, the books that they are reading. And um, the insight that I'm seeing with these students, they, they, the way that they're engaging this work, and the access I have to so much of their lives, which I would never have had in how class. Interesting, how, um, interesting. Yes, how interesting, how interesting. So, so, yes. so, so in, in, a, in a sense, I mean, I really would not have thought you to say this. Uh, uh, the, this, this remote way of engaging has brought greater attention and greater perception to what they're reading. Um, this is a, this is truly surprising, and I'm I'm wondering if in a minute or two you you could riff on 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 this on on why you think that might be. Yeah, I I think you're right. I mean, that's what I am actually saying is that I think I'm getting a quality of attention, a quality of critical thinking, and a quality of very sort of emotion emotion based engagement in the work that I would not know what's happening. And I, I, I don't want to say that it wasn't happening, but I would not know what's happening um, had we not had this experience. Because what happens is that they have to, every day after I give a lecture for an hour, they write their responses to the lecture, they write their responses to the literature. And I've allowed them to 
to personalize it and to sort of engage in some deeper questioning of the material um, in ways that would not happen in class. One thing is for sure, the, 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 the quiet ones, which would be the, the predominant, you know, the larger number of the students who would not really say anything in class. I have access to their thinking and the way they're engaging things, which makes me a better teacher, frankly, because I can then address um, some of the misconceptions and yet also rejoice in, in the way that they're engaging this work. You know, we're reading Jamaica Kincaid, Lorna Goodison, Derek Walcott, Kamal Blast with, you know, Lincoln Tracy Johnson. We're reading wonderful work and it's great to see them being sort of transformed by that by, by, by that literature in ways that I, I just don't think I would have I would have sent um, in, 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 as much in, in, in the classroom or the life setting. You know, it will be so interesting uh, when we go back to um, what passes for normal. Uh, and many people I've spoken to over the past few weeks are hoping that we don't go back just to life as we perceived it as normal, but maybe with a difference. And perhaps also this will hold true for, for teaching and for teaching methods. Um, perhaps you will combine the, the live element with other elements uh, that you, you find now quite interesting. People have said to me that maybe we are living now in what might be thought of as a philosophical moment. Or to, to quote the great line of Zora Neale Hurston, she says, there are years that ask questions and years that answer. We might be in one of those moments. And I'm, I'm wondering what, what you think about what I just said. And also, perhaps um, we are too quick now in ascribing meaning to this moment, too quick in trying to find a reason or a rationale for this moment. Kwame, tell me. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's true. I think Hurston's idea is, is a, it's a lovely idea, although I, I, think, um, <laughs> I think the world is so large and so complex that yeah. I, I don't know if we can sort of say there's an era where there are questions asked. I think we can say we can say that there are moments in each of our lives in which we are we are living and uh, and finding answers to questions and years when we are asking questions. I think human life is filled with that. This moment has 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 saddled us with a tremendous amount of questions, but it's also a moment in which we are living where questions and answers or people having a lot to say about things in a very public way is almost a ubiquitous presence because of Twitter and. Instagram and Facebook, everybody has something to say and everybody is, is sort of jockeying to have the great thing to say about this moment. Um, and I'm skeptical about it, um, but, 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 but not in any sort of peculiar way. I think one of the great values of, of, of life is if we live long enough, we have moments of engagement, moments of urgency, and then moments of reflection. And I, I, think, I think we must embrace them as they come along, there's an urgency now in this moment. Yes, there are real uh, crises of, of, of what is happening and, and, and crises that beg the question, what are we doing about race in this country? What are we doing about the, old, the, the older people in this country? What is this logic of this, what can be dispensed with and what can't be dispensed with? These are philosophical questions, but they're not questions of quiet reflection. I think they're questions that sometimes demand direct and urgent uh, questioning and answering. But, in, but we still have to have the poets and, and those who are going to sort of sit down and allow this to, to, to marinate and so that they can ruminate and think it through so that we can find our way to some understanding. But I think all moments, all philosophy, all philosophy I think, emerges out of difficulty, out of, out of, out of a crisis of meaning and, tr and crisis of understanding. And, and I, I think this one is especially right, right for, 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 for that kind of thinking. Kwame, I've heard you say and I've read that you think that a poet and a writer needs to be a witness. Um, and I'm I said this. I, yes, you've said this. Maybe maybe you don't know that you've said this. And being being a witness. Uh, being, you know, in, in, in some sense, you, you've also said the hard thing is to face the things that confuse us, that leave us feeling answerless, and then keep pushing in, keep thinking, keep staring it, at it, eventually trying to find a way through it. And I'm, I'm 
curious, you know, at this moment where we combine action with reflection, what 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 do you think we 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 how how do you think we should should comport ourselves? Um, I would say that there there is enough language out there. There's enough. Uh, it has enough being lived and said that that for me is, is, is sort of assures me that um, the idea of empathy, the ideas of, of of love and care and attentiveness and vigilance, all of these things are things that as human beings, I think we should all sort of be striving for the the kind of the care and, and attentiveness. I think the writer, the poet. Um, I believe that we are we are given whether we want it or not a diff, an, an, an additional burden, and it's the burden of witness. And I think being a witness is um, is, is something to accept because I think the world goes on around us, and therefore we can either witness it, sort of um, sort of observe it, um, and then we have the secondary practice of chronicling it. Um, we, we can do that or we cannot do that. And I think the challenge of the writer is to say, okay, this is my job. Right. My job is to see this. My job is not only to see this, but then to find the language to, 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 to articulate it and express it and to, to work it out. It's hard work. It's painful work. It's difficult work. Um, but, but that's what the writer, I think, is, 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 is expected to do. And I, I've, I've always felt that way. And um, the writers that manage to do that are the writers that I admire. Well, you, um, you know, I, I discovered so, through you uh, a poet I absolutely didn't know called Nikki Finney, um, who, yeah. who, who, incredible, and who said, poets cannot come to the page lightly. Yeah. I want you to, to unpack that because I, I'm sorry I interrupted you, but I got excited. Poets cannot come to the page lightly. You need to do the hard thing, whether it's Nikki Finney yeah. or whether it's Claudia Rankin, who I am familiar with. What does that mean? And what does that mean in part, perhaps, also at this present moment? You know, I think, I think Nikki, Nikki Finney stands out for me as one of the poets who um, thought, has seen herself sort of engaging the world facing the the current affairs of the world and then attempting to write verse in response to those things. And and to be honest with you, Paul, that is often viewed as a practice as not the best idea for poets. Um, The suggestion is that that is for reporters to do. You know, that is for... Um, for people who who, who are, are commentators on the the way of the world and and, and but where the poetry the poet is in in search of beauty in search of of a, a music that speaks to the moment but but Nikki understands herself as coming from a, 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 an older tradition and that is the tradition um, that we, we 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 see replicated in generation after generation and culture after culture um, but in the culture that I think speaks to her would be the griot tradition um, out of out of West and North Africa, where the, the poet is a kind of priestly figure, a kind of a figure that is, is, is responsible for being the voice of the community, telling its stories, retaining its stories, and giving it a perspective on those stories. Um, and I think Nikki, as an American poet, is one of the few poets that has managed to do that work without becoming pedantic. Um, without becoming somebody who is a polemicist, but becoming somebody who is still writing poetry of the highest order and yet forcing us to encounter the world that we are living in um, on a day-to-day basis in, in, in this heightened way. Um, and I think that's what makes her stand out. It's enviable what she's able to do. And, in, 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 and I think um, it's something that I, I admire greatly. I think it's the same thing with Claudia Rankin, actually, those that we mentioned, those two. I think those are two poets who managed to do that. And, and there are a lot of poets who try it, but don't do it as well. <laughs> we, we have to try, yeah. but I, I, I think the, the, the word that stood out for me uh, now was the word enviable. Um, you know, an, another comment that you've, you've made that is powerful and that I, I do believe in is that, in a sense, all poets 
are political. And it's the choice so, their, their their choices and also their omissions are highly significant. And in that context, I was thinking, particularly for this moment now, Kwame, of the, this wonderful poem by, by Bertolt Brecht, where he says, what kind of times are these when to talk about trees is almost a crime because it implies silence about so many horrors? This seems to me at the core of this moment. I, I think I think this is true, Paul, and and yet there's a weird thing that that I think is implied in the poem is the it seems to be uh, that it seems to be is a very important solution there because I think that as Langston Hughes would argue, as many poets would argue, the tension between beauty, the world. It, it, the graces of the world and, it, and, and, and then the tension between that and the broken quality of the world, mm. the urgent horrors mm. of the world. Mm. It is in that tension that we find poetry, I think. Mm. I think poetry must find a way to engage these two conflicting realities. So, so, so what does it mean then to write about trees in that moment. And I think that's what I was reaching for because what I was suggesting is, it's, it's, what I was saying was quite tautological, frankly, because of course, in the absence of politics is the presence of politics. It's a choice. I mean, this is, this is it. If you, if you don't have anything to say about a political situation, you are saying something about the political right. situation. This is, this is the act. It's, it's kind of tautological, but I think for the poet, it gives you permission to, to, to live as a living, living antenna in the world. That is, I will allow the world to bombard me. And as I write, as I sing, that bombardment will, will, will affect what I emerge with. And I think the poets who are open to that conflicting experience, Bob Marley singing um, his song, at the same time he, see, he sees the horrors of the world, he's able to say, how good and how pleasant it would be before God and man to see the unification of all Africans. As it's been said already, let it be done. We are the children of the Rasta man. In that moment, <laughs> it's struggle, it is hardship, but it's also good and pleasant and beautiful. That tension, I think, is, is one of the great, the great, the great achievements in, in, in poetry. And, 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 and Paul, I think that comes out of honesty. Honesty? It comes out of Honestly, Honestly, yeah, it comes, it comes out of pure, a truthful confrontation of experience, both its beauties and its ugliness, and the the honesty to tackle both of those things at the same time. I love this. I love this so much, and you know, I love the fact that you brought up Bob Marley just after we had mentioned Derek Walcott and and others. Um, I I also uh, learned that that Derek Walcott was very envious of the kind of poetry that um, that someone like Bob Marley was able to do within the framework of a song. Um, and, and that is interesting to me. Yes, it's true. I, I, and I think, you know, Walcott came from the same generation as my father. Mm. These are men who were trained in the colonial system, who recognized the tyranny of, of, colonial educa- of the colonial education in sort of, in sort of <laughs> shaping their value system of art and beauty. And yet, recognize themselves resisting that tyranny and sort of trying to work their way through to a, a sort of an honest a, appraisal of that relationship. Walter in, 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 in A Far Cry from Africa sort of crudely reducing it to divided in the vein, you know, and he says, how can I, how can I, you know, pick choose between this English tongue that I love? And, 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 and the Africa of the Kikuyu and the Mau Mau Rebellion. Um, how do I make that choice? But, but, but I think what Walker articulated, and it's, 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 I, I connect him to the generation of my father, was that they recognized in an artist like Bob Marley a kind of, a, a kind of freedom, a radical freedom from that tyranny of the, mm. the colonial influence. 
a, a willingness to break through with it. And they associated it with the usefulness, but they also associated it with the freedom to be able to make a choice in that space and to create something that Kamal Brathwaite would call torn and new, something something that is distinctive wow. to that place. And, and I think Walker sort of was drawn to that in, in Mali, drawn to that freedom, that capacity to be free. But also, Walcott himself talked about just the pure language of Mali when he, when he described No Woman, No Cry. And he said, if you can write a love song, as clearly and as simply and as beautifully as that, when he sings, my feet is my only carriage. You know, we'll cook corny porridge, of which I'll share with you. My feet is my only carriage. So I've got to push on through. And Walcott says, if I, if I want to write a, a love song so pure, a love poem so pure. Um, so, so they were recognizing his genius, no question, but they were also recognizing the path towards that freedom to, 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 to find a kind of uh, Caribbean-ness, um, envy in it, and in, because of the, 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 the cost to do that, that I think they paid, um, which, is, which I think is a fantastic thing, yeah. You know, um, I was also so intrigued to see uh, the passion you have for first lines, for the beginning of a poem, the beginning yes. for, for beginnings, and um, I um, I was reminded of a, a wonderful line by Jhumpa Lahiri, where she says, "The first sentence of a book is a handshake, perhaps an embrace." And you were mentioning Walcott, and I, of course, I immediately went to to look at. First sentences of Walcott I love, whether it's a time will come when with elation or the day with all its pain is yours, the ceaseless creasing of the morning sea. And then the line I so much love, which closes one of the poems of Derek Walcott, I so adore, Sea Grapes, where he says the classics can console but not enough. And I'm wondering if you can say something about those first lines and perhaps some of the closing lines you love? Yeah, you know, um, I, I mean, you know, because I've just been teaching Walcott in class and so on, and um, trying to get my students, and not, without, without much effort, having them engage in and understand the greatness of Walcott. Walcott, Walcott understood those basic truths about about the poetic line. I like that um, that, that, that line about the, the, the opening line of the poem is a, is a, is a handshake. I, I think it's, um, some would call it a kind of anthemic thing. I remember once I was sitting in a workshop with Walcott. I was, I'd invited him to come and do a workshop. So I was observing him talking to students and um, he had a student. And I don't know if you know, Walcott was a bit of a smudge, like, like really sort of impatient. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Impatient. No, I, I remember when he came to the New York Public Library That's right. That's where right. I was previously. That's, yes. And yes, the, impat yes. the impatience was palpable. That's right. And so, 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 so the student begins to read the poem, their poem, and Walcott stops them, this first line, and he says, okay, that's your line. Go to the next line. And the student read the next line and says, do you see what you just did? And they say, the student will know what he's talking about. <laughs> okay. And he says, you cannot start with one line without understanding that that line is setting the tone, the rhythm, the meter, the direction of the whole thing. And he says, I can tell you right away that you have not even understood your first line. You haven't understood what it, you haven't understood it as a line. And I was always fascinated by that kind of intense commitment to the idea of the line as a kind of marker of the poem. That is where it begins and where it ends. And then he went on to complain about the American habit of calling the ending of lines, line breaks. He hated that. <laughs> well, well, tell me why. Tell me why. I, I, I have so thought... he, said, he, said, he said it's only a prose writer will describe the end of a line of a poem as a line break because it presumes right. that the whole line continues and then you broke it in the middle. That's not what happened. You made a line and then you make another line and you make another line. These are lines. They are, he says, these are the blueprints of the poem. These are the sort of the building blocks of the poem. The poem is made of lines. You don't write prose and then break it up into bits. That's prose. That's not poetry. <laughs> he went on and on and on. 
But I bring that up because I think what you described, even in the, in the forms you see grapes and so on, is that Walker is a cute, any line, any opening line of Walker, you can see he's setting, the, the, he, he's doing that musical thing of setting the, 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 tone. the, the theme. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's, it's that sort of central theme and it will come back again and again. He understands it in that kind of ingrained and, and deep set way. Um, but you know, but, 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 you know all, but you know also that that last line um, of Sea Grapes, the classic skin yes. console, but not enough. Kwame, but not enough. But Kwame, yes. tell me, tell me, help me understand those two lines. I need you. But but, it, but that's the beauty of that line, isn't it? Isn't it, Paul? It, it's, so it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful beyond beyond anything that yes. we can say. I mean, we need yes. those classics. We need that form. We need of, that, we need we that form of consolation. But it is we not do. enough. It is not enough. What it's is enough. enough? What is enough? Well, you know, a lot of us have used that line to celebrate the emergence of a kind of Caribbean voice. So, so, they, they, so, so it's a little selfish of us because I think Walcott had a more sort of universal application. But for us, Walcott is saying, look, I grew up on these classes. They gave me some consolation. And I'm not inventing this, this, con this conundrum for Walcott. Walcott in What the Twilight Says expresses this explicitly and he describes himself as an interloper. He describes himself as a back street boy sort of entering into this classic world and trying to make sense of it. And he's saying, he's saying, I was sort of the outsider trying to enter this room. Um, and, and, then, and then he concludes that I make my own room. So he's saying that the classics, for all their comfort and their, all their giving, there's a sense in which they are not enough until we find a kind of a classic of our own voice and our own imagination. And, and I would like to generalize that by saying that while we, while we as people and as artists um, are, are shaped by what we have seen, there's a point at which we, we, we seek an, a voice that is peculiar to us, that has grown out, that, that, is, that is indebted to those classics, but is seeking a comforting, that is our own voice, our own kind of mother tongue. Um, I like to think this is true, um, but, but it's an unhelpful notion, except in retrospect. <laughs> you know, um, um, you know how, how, do you, how do you use that as a guide to writing? <laughs> I don't you know. You that as a kind of assessment of your life. Kwame, <laughs> Kwame, in closing, would you do me the pleasure, we don't have quite the time for the whole poem, but would you do me the pleasure of um, reading a poem you have written during this time, I think, um, the, yes. uh, the After Earth, maybe we can hear some of your opening lines in closing. Sure. So I'll just read a few lines and then... Please. Then they'll be good. Yeah. The After Earth. They will call it hope, they who say, look to the After Earth, the end of the plague, the new age returns, post-viral nation, the survivors, the new survivors. They have titled speeches, songs, and grand epic novels this way, and most are whispering of the boon times, the times of plenty, the triumph of the survivors. These are the sermons of hope, they say. I have in these days of long considered, in these days long, of long walks, considered the me meaning of art, the promise of art, for lasting meaning. I'll stop there, but that, I think it's just a case Well, I, I have to tell you, Kwame, um, in a time which I hope will be soon, I wish to take a long walk with you and discuss all these things further, including this poem and what we have learned from this moment without a facile learning and jumping too quickly to conclusions about what will happen after this moment passes. Kwame, it's been such a pleasure to speak to you. I can't tell you. And I wish I was one of those students just listening to, <laughs> to you. Well, Paul, it's always great talking to you. And I know we, you know, we, we had hoped to meet up at Calabas this year, but it won't happen yet. It won't say. happen yet, but, um, it's, but... A, it's a deferred pleasure. It's a deferred pleasure.
So thank you so much, Paul. Thank, Great talking. Thank you. you. Take care of yourself, Kwame. Bye bye. All right. Cheers. To support this show and Dublab's progressive programming, go to dublab.com/support. Thank you.